So we're going to talk about um, three more tools or techniques here. The first one is using the thenar eminence, so the pad below the thumb. This is one that is a softer area. There's not a hard bony part to it. There are bones under there, but you have all of the adductor and flexor pollicis muscles there on top. So this isn't something I would use to like grind hard into a bony area of her body. But I do use it to move bony areas around. So if I'm working to move the scapula, one of the things I see a lot is the levator scap and upper trap fibers shortening and pulling the scapula up, your shoulders coming towards your ears. So I do spend some time fighting that by pushing that scapula laterally and into depression or down. So working right along that levator and some of those upper trap fibers. And this can be static push and hold, but I tend to kind of work pressing and releasing. There's also a technique called round rubbing where you're literally just making a small circle with the pressure staying consistent. So I'm pressing in and then rubbing in a circle. Tui Na, the, the Chinese style of massage, literally means to push and to squeeze or grasp. And its older name was An Mo, which means to push down and rub in a circle. Okay. That's super, super uh, practical naming, unlike so many of their other things that have fancy, flowery, poetic terms. <laughs> there, there you go. That round rubbing gets used traveling quite a bit. It's not a super heavy technique. It's more of kind of warm up or finishing kind of movement. But a lot of times I'll do this all the way down. This table's way too low, but uh, a lot of times I'll do that and just sort of work my way down the erector spinae, making circles. So the pressure is all coming through the pad of the thumb, not the thumb itself. It's just along for the ride, but I don't want to hitchhike or thumb it. It doesn't need to be off the body. As much as possible, that pressure is coming from my leg, and my wrist is being extended, bent, yeah. not actively, but passively. If you're struggling with any of these techniques with the fingers and everything up, take a second and try to shake out your arm, place your fingertips on the person, and bend down. There shouldn't be any active firing to get your wrist into extension. I'm moving, but I'm not going like this. I'm not firing those extensors to get here. It's passive. She'll bend your wrist for you. You don't have to work at it. So that's using the thenar eminence. It works on any muscle that you can fit that part of your hand in on, but I find it really useful for this upper trap levator scap area getting in here. So if you're tired of using knuckles in this area, you can flip around and work both sides, one side, how, however that feels good to you. A lot of times I do the sort of outer circles like that, work down as far as I can without hunching over the table. So thinner eminence, good little tool for broad areas, especially right in here. Good deal. The next one that I'm going to do is just using the olecranon, the elbow. Um, everyone here hopefully has gotten some practice yesterday. We have uh, the benefit here of, of big areas. It's easy to fit your elbow in everywhere up here on the back and, and whatnot. The downside is, though, that it's often very pointy. Right? It, it doesn't have somewhere to kind of notch into. You're on a big, broad area of muscle. So it can feel kind of too much of a, a single spot. Two, two point specific. One way to kind of counter that and a way to get comfortable with how much pressure you're using with your elbow is to take advantage of your other hand. So if I'm going to come in and work here at the upper part of her paraspinals with my elbow, I'm placing my elbow in the tiger's mouth or the cup of my hand so that the pressure is coming through the tip of my elbow, but I'm feeling some of that pressure into my hand so that I have some feedback on how hard am I actually pressing. Of course, her impression or feedback is going to trump what my hand's telling me. If she says, ouch, back off, even if it doesn't feel like you're pushing as hard as you think you are, uh, or as hard as she thinks you are. So I can apply that pressure. When working on bigger areas with the elbow, the degree of flexion in your elbow changes how pointy the olecranon is, is going to feel. 
because you're contacting with less of a surface. So if I open the elbow up a little bit, I'm working on a broader area of the ulna. So I can work even in areas that tend to be very tender. And again, this table's way too low for me. Where if I'm coming directly in, that may be a little too much. I can lay the forearm down slightly, and I'm touching with a couple of inches of the ulna now. And then I can work more comfortably for her. That pressure can be static. A lot of times I do a little shiatsu press and release technique and walk my way up the muscle. Or I'll push in and drag. All, all of those are fair game. And that can be any direction. You don't have to push down the body. You can push up. Is that okay? <laughs> I tend to stick mostly to the same side of the body when I'm using elbows. Even on a table the right height, you have to lean forward just a little bit to use an elbow. That's okay. We want to bend at the hip and not in the spine. But trying to reach across to the far side, you basically lay over on the person. There are a couple of exceptions, sometimes for this lower a uh, little notch over the QL. I will reach across to the far side of the table, brace the body on this side, and pull my arm down back towards me to get pressure with the elbow. But I don't do that for very long because my body doesn't like being leaned way over. I'd prefer most of the time just to come to this side and work in. This other hand, even if you're comfortable with your pressure and you know how to modulate it, and, and you're not hurting people with too much pressure, I still prefer on their body. Even if I'm not actually tightly tucked in, I have it nearby. I just think more contact feels better most of the time. And I've not had any complaints from that in 12 years. So obviously, you got to be careful where you're sticking it. If you're working on a glute, you don't want to be grabbing their glute muscles like that. But, but we're going to get to the hip. But if you're working in the glutes, that other hand is often here in the lumbar spine. We're down here stabilizing a leg. So I'm still keeping contact with it. I'm not just jabbing an elbow in. Feel free to play with the elbow all the way up to that levator insertion and, and upper trap fibers here, anywhere through the spine. Just get a hang for posting it in that little nook of the hand and play with the degree of flexion in the elbow. If you're f comfortable and having fun with that, that little jostle is also fair game. It's much easier to do with your dominant hand, but definitely spend a little time practice with your non-dominant hand. Oh, that's good. The more relaxed your arm is, the better your jostle is going to be, regardless of what you're jostling. I do a fair bit of thenar eminence jostling. That first thing we were doing, where I'll press into the hand here and oscillate the hand to get a little jostle. Certainly is much easier on me with my dominant hand, but you should be able to do it with either. If you don't practice, you won't be able to have. So, all right, so I've seen our eminence. We have the olecranon and ulna. And, and I'm talking about the last couple of inches, but there's nothing wrong with using the whole ulna. If you want broader pressure, you can lay that forearm down. Sometimes I'll even just grab my own arm like a rolling pin and push that pressure along the rector spinae. Just try to relax that arm as much as possible. Doesn't need to be knifed out or anything crazy. So the ulna is fair game. The last one we'll do before we, we break up uh, to practice is some cross fiber strumming. This can be done a million different ways. The um, way that I was first taught it was simply with fingers. Thankfully, my Twina teachers weren't thumb specialists, so they didn't get in and do it like this with their thumbs, but a lot of people do. And that's okay, it's just hard on your thumbs. So you can switch and use your four fingers to do that. Remember what makes strumming or cross fiber really effective is that the pressure stays the same. You're not lightening up as you pass over the higher part of the, the taut band. You apply that pressure and you drag it across with that pressure. Some areas, like right through here, you'll get a, a distinct strum where it kind of snaps like you're pl pl uh, plucking a banjo, rather. But generally, yeah, for at least the way that we do it in Tween Ah, we tend to hold that pressure stable and work back and forth. 
that can be pretty intense, so listen to your patient. Um, but my preferred way to do it actually eliminates all of the, the tips of the fingers and uses these pip joints. Whether I'm reaching across or working on the same side, it doesn't matter. I'm applying pressure through those pip joints and I'm going to drag them back and forth across the muscle the same way. And this can be intense, so communicate. Let me know if I'm hurting you. My preferred way to do this is actually two hands at the same time. And so what I'll do is stick out my one thumb, grab it with my other hand, and lay them both down and move them together. I like that broader area. I get to work all at the same time. And for a lot of people, it feels better than just the one hand. So just strumming back and forth. One of the things to try to do in this, uh, with this technique is maintain a fairly neutral wrist. I'm not curling my wrist really hard this way or this way. I want to position my body so that my wrist is as straight as possible. And I'm putting that pressure through that phalange into my hand. I'm not pushing like this on the backs of the fingers.